Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks for attending this uh, information session on Churchill Fellowships. This is our final um, information session for the year. We've been uh, doing a lot of these, uh, at least two a week. And the theme for this one is arts. And um, I would like to uh, introduce myself. My name's Adam Davey. I'm the CEO of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Uh, we're based here in Canberra, Ngunnawal country. And I'm going to begin this information session with an overview uh, of what Churchill Fellowships are about, uh, how you apply and, and what we're looking for. Um, and then I'll be introducing two uh, Churchill Fellows, um, Norwena um, and Patricia, who are going to um, give you some pretty exciting information about their fellowships and what they've been doing and, and some insights into how that all works. So um, that's how it's going to work tonight. Well, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Australia's um, First Nations people, the uh, traditional custodians of this land and, and all of the lands that you're all uh, zooming in from and um, to pay my respects to Elders uh, past, present and emerging. Um, I'd like to welcome any Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people who have um, tuned in as well. Um, I'm letting people know that we've got a newly formed Indigenous Churchill Fellows Network, which is pretty exciting and uh, all of our uh, alumni who are part of that network are keen to um, offer advice and assistance to any potential applicants. So um, get in touch with us if that's you and we can um, connect you there as well. So a little bit of housekeeping, you will be able to submit questions via the Q&A function. So you can do that at any time. If you uh, miss out or you forget or think of a question later, uh, don't stress, you can go to our website, um, you can contact us um, by email, you can call the office, we're a small office here, we're always happy to answer your questions. Um, so uh, I also wanted to acknowledge the um, difficult times that we've been going through with COVID. I think it's, it's been a tough couple of years and it continues to be um, quite difficult. We've had flooding in Australia, there's global um, instability. Um, and look, I think it's a time to be positive. So I hope that um, if you're tuning into this uh, webinar that you are coming from a position of positivity. Um, I'm pretty excited that we've got Church School Fellowships on offer again. Last year was the first time in our 56-year uh, history that we hadn't offered um, any church or fellowships. So this is, this is exciting for us. So a little bit of uh, history, um, and I think it's important to understand uh, where church or fellowships come from. But one of the questions I'm, I'm often asked in relation to that is, uh, where does the funding come from to pay for church or fellowships? And you know, there's quite an interesting um, story about that. So when um, Sir Winston Churchill resigned, as the British uh, Prime Minister in 1955. He was 80 years of age and he'd served under five reigning monarchs. He'd survived uh, three wars. He'd been a writer, an historian, a journalist, an adventurer, a painter. He even won the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, in 1953. So as you can imagine, there was a widespread desire to honour Sir Winston Churchill and to uh, capture the essence of his public service, um, his inspiration, his intellect, and I think even his humour to an extent uh, for future generations. Uh, like he wasn't perfect and we acknowledge that and you can read some really insightful essays that we've commissioned um, on our website that, you know, I guess look at Sir Winston Churchill's legacy through a contemporary lens. But you know, there really is um, one thing for sure, he was someone who believed readily that anything is possible if you put your mind to it and that um, the greatest figures in history were those who uh, made a contribution to public service and to their fellow countrymen. So when the Prime Minister of Australia uh, at the time, uh, Sir Robert Menzies, announced the news of Sir Winston's death to Australians in January 1965, he also announced a public fundraising appeal. And uh, I think that still remains um, one of Australia's most successful public fundraising appeals. Um, there was a door knock held nationally and over 220,000 uh, people participated in that supported by the Return Services League. And um, the generosity of Australians was so, so huge and um, combined with government um, uh, contributions and business con financial contributions, uh, you know, about 2.2 million pounds, so around $4 million was raised to set up the Churchill Trust as a perpetual legacy to award Churchill Fellowships. Um, interesting, you know, little uh, bit of trivia is that banks actually opened on that Sunday to uh, receive the cash that was raised. That's how, how big a deal it was. 
So that, um, those funds are carefully uh, managed and we receive uh, donations and, and generous bequests from time to time, which help top up our funding. And we use the uh, earnings from that money that's invested um, carefully uh, to pay for fellowships um, each year. So that's a little bit of a history and a bit of a story there. Um, so I encourage you to have a look on our website. Um, if you want to learn a bit more about Sir Winston Churchill, I think there's more written about him than perhaps anyone in the world ever. Um, so you can get online and, and, and certainly easily find out a bit more. Um, which kind of gets to what are the attributes of a Churchill Fellow? And um, people quite often ask me, well, what are you looking for? You know, what is a Churchill Fellow? So Churchill Fellows really, uh, look, they could be anyone, but they're the type of people who are passionate and committed to a particular issue or topic. So someone that's re you know, really committed to, to improving or learning uh, in a particular area. And, and then importantly, willing to share that knowledge uh, you know, with their communities uh, to make Australia a better place. So that's kind of really in a nutshell, what we're looking for. And uh, in terms of Churchill Fellowships um, themselves, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about um, what they are. They're, they're a unique and prestigious opportunity uh, for Australians, uh, open to Australians from all walks of life. So it's not an academic um, scholarship. So you don't need to have completed high school. We're not after, um, you know, someone that's, that's attained a certain educational qualification. You can, you can be anyone in that regard. Um, and it's not a funding grant. So, you know, there's a lot of empowerment in a church or fellowship. Um, you know, we, we do empower you to undertake your project and go and do it. We don't ask you to acquit every cent and pay back any unspent money from the fellowship. You know, it's, it's well-funded. It's there for you to conduct your project. Um, it's not just an overseas trip. So keep that in mind. It's actually the start of a lifelong journey and your contribution to making Australia better. You know, we have a saying, which is once a fellow, always a fellow. Um, you know, we don't speak of previous Churchill Fellows. You know, once you're awarded a Churchill Fellowship, you are a Churchill Fellow for life. And the types of people who are awarded, you know, typically continue to, um, you know, work in that area of their Churchill Fellowship for, for many years to come. Now, Churchill Fellowship doesn't need to comprise um, you know, formal research. So it doesn't need to be like an academic research approach. Um, you could be uh, learning new skills, undertaking a course, uh, building networks, observing best practice in your chosen field. Um, and the fellowship, it's only for overseas travel uh, between four and eight weeks. And um, I've got some possible changes there I'll talk about shortly. And you take that trip in one continuous journey. We've awarded nearly four and a half thousand Churchill Fellowships uh, since we were established in 1965. And each year we typically award over 100 fellowships. Um, someone will ask how many applications we get. So pre-COVID, we'll probably get between 1,000 and 1,100 applications. It's a bit hard to know this year. It's looking pretty normal, but um, you know, time will tell. There's still a month to go before applications um, close. And, um, you know, I have to say that Churchill Fellows travel, travel the globe on the widest range and depth of topics. And they bring back to this country, um, you know, information, networks, projects, uh, products, ideas and innovations that are all designed to help make this country um, stronger. Now, there are some eligibility requirements. You need to be an Australian citizen or as of this year, you can be a permanent resident of Australia. Um, you do have to be aged 18 years or over. We don't have an upper age limit. I'm pretty sure that 70 years of age is currently our um, most senior awarded uh, Churchill Fellow, but there's no limit there. And, um, you know, I think we've had some interest this year from, um, you know, uh, as young as you know, 21 um, right up into the 70s. So it's really good to see that, that spread of ages. Um, the ability to travel overseas is essential. And um, we can provide support for you. So for example, if you have a disability, you might have some um, assistance required. You might need a carer to go with you. So talk to us about those things. Uh, we can absolutely help. Uh, in terms of um, the ability to travel, I've had a few people ask about uh, COVID vaccinations. We don't have a requirement that you need to be vaccinated um, against COVID, but I think you'll find um, 
that that will be a requirement for some time for traveling internationally that governments put in place. So all of those sorts of things, having a passport, visas, et cetera, you, you need to be willing to comply with those if you're going to um, do a church or fellowship and travel overseas. Um, we do now, as of this year, offer uh, virtual research options for people who can't travel, <clears throat> excuse me, due to a uh, disability or perhaps um, caring responsibilities. So that's something, if that's you, um, I can uh, I'd probably say get in touch with us to discuss, but that's something we're definitely um, now able to offer. And um, for people living in remote parts of Australia, something new we're offering now as well is the opportunity to undertake um, domestic uh, travel. So typically um, it's for international travel only. Um, that said, if you live in Norfolk Island, um, you can have Australia as part of your destination. And now if you live in remote uh, parts of Australia, you can also um, uh, travel domestically. But what I'll need you to do is to contact us and talk about it because we've just made this change and our application form doesn't have a box to tick to say that. So um, do get in touch if that's you. Um, a church or fellowships an individual project. So you can't apply as a team. We, we, we quite often get asked each year, oh, can a team apply? The answer is no. Um, that doesn't mean you can't collaborate with your team uh, you know, before you go, um, maybe while you're over, overseas and on your return, but you should be applying as an individual. Um, it's okay to be undertaking tertiary studies. I think some people think we say that you can't be enrolled in university. That's fine, but you can't apply for a church or fellowship to do a project that becomes part of your study and helps you achieve that um, master's or PhD or whatever. And the reason for that is that church or fellowship is, is in and of itself a significant undertaking and uh, you're expected to commit 100% to your church or fellowship um, and to um, you know, provide a report on your return and to continue to focus on, on uh, disseminating those findings and, and doing other things. So look, I really want you to hear when it comes to personal eligibility, that we are looking for a diverse range of people from all walks of life. And that's not just a saying that we throw around, that's our organizational mantra and it always um, has been. So in terms of the projects, um, you know, your project has to be suitable for a fellowship. And the good news there is that that's a very broad um, marker. So uh, really there needs to be a benefit to the Australian community. And that's gonna be your job when you apply is to, explain how you going overseas and you know acquiring knowledge learning skills on that particular issue or topic and coming back and sharing that is going to be a benefit to the Australian community in some way so that could be bringing back and sharing knowledge ideas practices or skills um, you do need to demonstrate that you fully explored your topic within Australia to be considered so I guess really in a nutshell we don't want to pay you know an average of $28,000 for a church or fellowship to send you overseas when you could have you know gone for a trip um, just over the border or um, interstate somewhere uh, in Australia to find out what you're going overseas to find out so make sure you know what is happening in Australia and that you're confident that you know there's a real need to travel overseas because our assessors they're, they're pretty keen on um, Google and other internet searches we can quickly find out if um, that work that you say no one's doing in Australia is in fact being done in Australia. So uh, that's quite important. Um, the project had to be a self-contained project. So uh, in addition to not forming part of a um, tertiary or university degree, uh, it can't be partly funded by another organisation. So we can't take an application that you know, you're saying, oh, it's going to form part of this project I'm doing with this big company. We're not uh, a travel budget for, for your organisation. You know, as I said, this is a standalone prestigious award. It's, a, it's something that, that really does stand on its own strength. Um, so in terms of project eligibility, uh, eligibility um, we don't set uh, limits on the topics or the issues, and that's really a strength um, of Churchill Fellowships. So you design, you know, your own project. If you can think of a suitable topic, then really there's no limits. Um, we offer some what we call sponsored fellowships. So they come about either through a bequest where someone has left some money to the trust and they've said, look, we're, I really want to see um, church of fellowships being offered in my name um, on this particular topic. 
for for this particular you know, type of person to apply for. So you'll see we have some of those. And we also have some active sponsors, individuals, uh, organisations, some government departments who, who are willing to fund Churchill Fellowships to see people do research on specific topics. So you can um, apply uh, for those. So in the case of the arts, we do have um, quite a few. Uh, you know, for example, the Bob and June Cricket uh, Churchill Fellowship. Bob was a Churchill Fellow and he left a bequest to the Trust. And so uh, he was a sculptor um, and worked in marble. And so we've got a fellowship specifically to award to someone in visual arts. And we have other ones um, which you'll be able to see on our website in relation to music and theatre and a range of different um, things like that. Now, when you um, fill out your application, you'll have the option of selecting from two, um, up to two sponsor fellowships you'd like to be considered for. I think it's important to understand that that won't advantage or disadvantage your application in any way. So um, you, if you select a Churchill, a sponsored Churchill Fellowship to be considered for, that helps us identify that you might be suitable for that. But if you forget or you just didn't tick the box, um, we'll we'll look at your project if you're successful and if it's suitable to a award to a sponsored fellowship, we'll arrange that anyway. So don't worry too much about that. That's probably my advice to you. Um, so applying, there is an online form. Applications close on the 28th of April. So, you know, the clock is ticking. Um, you've got the website address there. There's a big application button at the top. Um, if you can't use the form, uh, again, you might have a disability and the form is inaccessible to you, please contact us and, and, and we'll see if we can work with you on a, a way that you can submit the application. Um, we can provide some support. So, for example, I had an applicant um, who has dyslexia and uh, they needed a scribe to help them fill out the form and, and we were able to provide a little bit of um, financial support for that. Um, so there may be those sorts of things um, and we're happy to consider them. Um, the form is, is pretty easy. A bit of advice given we're late in the process here, there's, there's no password, you use an email address and then you'll be emailed a code, one-time use code every time you log in. So you can um, start your application uh, save it, come back to it many times, and each time you log in, you'll be emailed a one-time use code. The hot tip is to check your junk or spam um, filter or folder in your email, because quite often the code might end up there, then you'll think that the form is not working and you can't get in. So that's my tip for that one. Um, do remember that you're competing against um, all other applicants, so you've got to think about how you can convince the selectors to invest in you and your project idea. Um, you're going to need two uh, references, and so that's another hot tip is given there's only a month to go, um, think quickly about who your referees will be and get in touch with them and make sure they're going to be available over the next few weeks to submit their reference for you. You'll, you'll email them through the application form, they'll get an email, they'll go online and they'll put in your reference um, automatically into your form. You won't be able to submit your application um, on the closing date, if you don't have your referees in, you need two. Someone who can vouch for you from a personal perspective um, and your personal characteristics and someone who can vouch for your project. So someone with some credibility and knowledge in your particular field or topic who can, I guess, really say, look, this, this issue is, is of importance. Um, if you select or if you request more than two references, you'll need to choose two only from within the application form. Again, it won't let you submit. If you've selected three or more, you have to select two. Um, so the form is fully automated. It'll tell you if you haven't filled out something or got something correct, but um, just make sure you get in and start your application as soon as you can. It gives you a chance to look at the questions and make sure that you've got um, all that technology working out okay. In terms of your itinerary, um, we do get questions about this and just to make this one really clear, um, what we want in the application form is for you to list um, which countries you want to go to, which cities, which organisations or people you want to meet with and why. So, you know, I am want to go to New York to meet with um, this person, whoever, and I want to observe their practice and, and um, or I want to attend a, a workshop where I'm going to learn these new skills, whatever it might be. And then, you know, how many days you're going to be there. We, I think we ask for like half week to week blocks. Now, um, you don't have to have contacted those people or organisations and sort of locked in 
meetings with them for your application because you're not going to be traveling till next year sometime anyway so we don't ask you to actually organize those meetings there's nothing wrong with contacting people or organizations just to sound them out and say look you know do you accept meetings with people um, applying for a church or fellowship? You know, I just wanted to check that out if it's reasonably feasible that you would meet with me. I think what we've learned over the last couple of years is that, you know, pandemics happen, things happen, uh, things can change. So I wouldn't go to too much effort trying to lock meetings in. We're not expecting that at all at the application stage. You'll have time once you're awarded um, the fellowship to, I guess, nut out and lock down um, your itinerary. So it's really important that you don't, um, treat it as a sort of competition to see how many countries you can visit in four to eight weeks. Um, we don't want you running yourself ragged. You need time uh, in your itinerary uh, to have a weekend, time to um, absorb the culture of the countries that you're in and understand the context um, of, of the meetings that you're having. Uh, you need time to be able to attend meetings that you didn't know you were going to get because you met with someone and they said, oh, are you, are you here tomorrow or the day after? You should go and meet with so-and-so. And if you've got an itinerary that's so jam-packed that you just can't take up those opportunities, that's a lost opportunity. So keep that in mind. Um, that's the good thing about a church or fellowship. Uh, it's, it's an experience. It's not a, a race to get around the world as quickly as possible. Um, with your itinerary, uh, the other thing you can do is you might like to stay on overseas at your expense, um, you know, for a holiday, um, and that's fine. You can do that. Um, some people meet their families at the end. Some people take their families with them and, and pay for their airfares, and, and they take them. Um, but there's that kind of flexibility, and that's up to you as well. Um, you don't need to worry about the cost of your fellowship in terms of, oh, I'll, I'll add up how much it's going to cost. Don't do that. We do that. So um, that should take a bit of pressure off you if you're worried about um, how much work it is putting your itinerary um, together. The other thing I should have mentioned there is we, we won't send you to travel uh, travel to countries where Smart Traveller um, says that you're not able to go, obviously. So you'll only be able to go to places that are safe. We do have travel insurance. That's all covered in your um, fellowships. Uh, a little bit about COVID, um, you know, it's it's created a lot of disruption. Um, we do have Churchill Fellows travelling now. I've had Churchill Fellows uh, go overseas and come back already this year, which is really cool. Um, the experiences were pretty smooth, I would say, and it's only getting smoother. Um, so hopefully by the time you travel, if you're successful this year in 2023, um, maybe things will be much closer to what we remember as normal Perhaps it'll never be quite the same, but it's certainly um, opening up a lot more. In terms of the selection process, we do have um, a, a selection committee and in the larger states like um, New South Wales and Victoria, selection panels um, that help assess applications. So um, what the process is, is there'll be a shortlisting process and then interviews. So in New South Wales and Victoria, they actually have two rounds of interviews because of the large number of applications. Um, so you might get shortlisted by the panel to an interview and then recommended to a final interview with a selection committee. So on those panels and committees, we have uh, a range of people from different backgrounds, um, usually quite senior people that have good experience, um, whether it's from you know, the health sector, education, arts, uh, commerce, whatever it is, agriculture. We try and get a good mix of people. Um, keep in mind that there might be someone um, who's assessing uh, that doesn't know what you're talking about, if your project's quite technical or, or, or a bit um, niche. So you know, don't use jargon, use plain English. Try, try and explain things in a way that someone that does have no idea about what you're talking about can understand. I think that's really quite important to give yourself the best shot. You'll see on our website, um, there is a, um, uh, the dates for the interviews uh, is available for you to look at and, um, one thing to keep in mind is about half the people who do get selected for interviews will be successful. Um, so if you do get shortlisted for an interview, that's, uh, I think, worthy of celebration in itself because um, it's, it's a very competitive process. Um, all the recommendations after interviews, and the interviews will be finished by the end of July, are re reviewed uh, by a board in September, mid-September, and you'll find out around then. So we, there's a little gap there between the end of July and the September meeting where we have to undertake all the costings of your fellowships to work out you know, um, 
what, what our budget will be and if we can afford to award as many as we wanted. Um, we're often asked for some tips on the application process. And I guess, you know, one of the best tips is read and address the selection criteria. Um, use as little jargon as possible, uh, be clear and succinct. So do remember it's a very competitive process. Um, Churchill Fellowships are you know, prestigious. They help open doors to organisations and people who otherwise might not meet with you. Um, they're highly contested, but this isn't a reason to be shy. So you know, I would say to you, if, you're, if you've made it to this uh, information session, you're obviously interested. Um, you probably have a great idea. Um, now's the time to back yourself. Don't, don't be shy. Um, put yourself forward, put an application together, finish it, hit submit because you know, this is a great opportunity and there's no reason um, why it couldn't be you. So um, you'll be competing against everyone else, obviously, who lodges an application and most people satisfy the criteria. So you, know, you need to think, um, how are you gonna make your application stand out? Can you paint a picture that there's you know, a burning platform? This issue is something that needs to be done now um, and you're the right person to do it and, and you're gonna do something with that knowledge if you're given this opportunity. So that's, that's really important. Um, just coming to the end of my piece, uh, on the slide is our phone number if you need to call the office uh, with any questions and our website, which I'm sure you probably all um, had a quick look at already. So you will we'll find on our website all the Churchill Fellows. Um, you can search by name, by state, by year, by um, category, uh, keyword search for their pro projects and have a look on there and, and see what other people have done, maybe read some of their reports. That's not a bad way to kind of get a feel for it as well. Um, but really uh, another good tip is to um, start an application as soon as you can and start filling out the questions and get a sense of what it's like. Churchill Fellows always tell us that that process of um, getting the application together was really instructive and helped them to refine their project ideas. So don't leave it to the last minute because it's not going to be good enough. It won't be your best application. Um, you've still got, you know, uh, plenty of time if you start soon. Um, so on that note, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to introduce our uh, first speaker, Morwenna. And um, as Morwenna gets her slides ready, I'll just say a little bit about her. Morwenna um, was awarded her Churchill Fellowship in 2018. She's from New South Wales. And her Churchill Fellowship was to explore inclusive music programs, venues and festivals, which actively engage disabled people. She's based in Sydney, she works nationally and internationally. And uh, through her fellowship, she researches inclusive music programs, venues and festivals. So I'm going to not steal her thunder and hand over to Morwenna. Thank you so much, Adam, and really nice to be with you all here this evening. Great to see so many names um, joining us from across the art sector tonight. Um, as Adam said, my name's Morwenna, um, and I'm joining you tonight from Gadigal country here in Sydney. My pronouns are she and her, um, and just a visual description of myself for anyone who might find that helpful. Um, I'm, a, I'm a woman in my late 30s um, with dark brown hair tied back in a bun tonight um, and some dark rim glasses around my face, uh, sitting in my son's bedroom um, with a navy and uh, pink and purple top on. Um, so uh, 2018 was a little while ago, but um, we've got, uh, Trish and myself have uh, been invited along tonight to have a chat to you about um, our respective fellowships that we went on. So I thought I'd uh, share a little bit of my experience with you. Um, so as Adam said, my project was uh, primarily looking at music and disability. And the research question that I tackled is down the bottom of this slide, which is um, how can the Australian music industry include more disabled artists, participants and audiences um, in its work? And I spent the majority of my time um, over in the UK uh, and also uh, Ireland and some of the US as well um, over a period of that, that full eight weeks. Um, so uh, I did kind of see the Churchill Fellowship as a bit of a race, which in hindsight maybe wasn't the best idea. And um, my fellowship took place over 60 days. Um, and in that time, um, I went to two different continents, three different countries, uh, 17 cities, um, and conducted uh, 83 interviews um, 
um, 72 organisations and 124 individuals. So a lot of big numbers there. And um, it was a it was absolutely a whirlwind, but my particular goal was around seeing, um, visiting as many music organisations, festivals and venues who were doing work in the disability space as I could possibly squeeze in. Um, and I certainly, uh, certainly did that. So to give you a, a sample of some of the people that I was able to spend time with, I had five main groups of, of people that I were, was visiting. I um, was really excited to spend time with some leading international disabled musicians. Um, so people like Evelyn Fleming um, and some younger emerging musicians. Uh, it was so fantastic to really hear um, lived experience from, from the voice of, of musicians living with disability. Um, raft of different types of music organisations, um, including uh, organisations that do some really interesting things around assistive music technology um, and, and access, uh, organisations that run inclusive music programs or ensembles, um, mainstream music organisations such as the Born in the Symphony Orchestra who have disability specific programs and Bournemouth was interesting in that they have uh, an ensemble purely made up of disabled musicians called Resound um, who in fact the year I was there performed at the BBC Prom so on a, a main stage sort of international platform. Um, festivals, uh, obviously heaps of fun. Um, I've got to spend some time with the team at Glastonbury, spent some time in Edinburgh with both the Fringe and the, um, the Edinburgh International Festival as well, uh, as, long, as well as the major venues, so Kennedy Centre and Lincoln Centre in the US, um, Barbican in the UK is some examples. Um, and it wasn't the main focus of my project, but also spent some time uh, looking at training institutions, um, understanding that the, the career pathways that we have available for disabled musicians really impact whether or not they can have a career in music. So uh, Manhattan School of Music, the Guildhall School um, uh, were a couple of examples there as well. Uh, so we were able to, um, we we're invited to share some highlights from our trip and um, certainly some of mine were meeting um, some of my heroes in terms of disabled musicians. So there's a photo on the screen of me with Evelyn Glennie um, in her, uh, her studio in Cambridge. Um, was also able to see some incredible performances over the Churchill period as well. Um, and my fellowship experience was an interesting one because um, there is quite a lengthy sort of process between applying and, and going on your fellowship, as Adam said. And um, I sort of, you know, applied at the beginning of 2018. And um, by the time I uh, found out I'd been successful, having gone through the whole process, I um, found that I was, I had the good news that I was pregnant. Um, so obviously needed to delay um, my trip a little bit until I had a, a child on the outside. And uh, I uh, left Australia with a six month old um, and came back to Australia with a 10 month old. Um, and of course my, my very, um, very lovely um, supportive partner. Um, so there's a picture of, of us leaving on our trip at, at the beginning they're all very excited um, and of course all sorts of things can happen over a period of time and um, we we're also asked to speak a little bit about the unexpected and yes there was lots of um, lots of amazing things that I learnt um, which you know some of which I'd perhaps predicted and others not but probably the most unexpected thing for me is I did exactly what Adam said and had a had a nice family holiday at the end of the Churchill and um, we uh, had a family ski trip in Austria and I ended up coming home with a, a brand new Austrian knee um, so that was that added an exciting kind of end to my last week of my fellowship uh, period but I have to say the Austrian knee is um, so much better than the other knee now so um so that was a, a nice uh, outcome of the fellowship as well um in terms of what I learned on the fellowship, obviously gathered a huge amount of information from those um, many organisations that I visited. And it was really fantastic to have, uh, you know, that that need to sit down and write a, a really comprehensive report. And I'm really pleased that that's been useful, not only in my career, but it's it's been a document that's been cited um, in other research publications and um, has been, I think, valuable to to the sort of broader music industry, um, made a heap of connections and 
it actually, you know, obviously I was doing this on maternity leave and it gave me the confidence to take a leap of faith and, um, you know, quit my day job at the Australia Council and set up uh, my own consulting practice. Um, so I'm now a consultant who works in diversity, access and inclusion, um, sometimes with music organisations, but also uh, around the arts more broadly. Um, and I think without a church or fellowship, that's probably not something I would have had the confidence to think was possible or, or to have achieved. And certainly the reputation that comes with being a Churchill Fellow has been useful in, in starting my own small business. Um, I'm still in touch with a lot of the people that I spent time with overseas and in fact I'm still regularly working with an organisation called Attitude is Everything which is the music service organisation in the UK which um, helps music organisations to do access and inclusion work well um, and I'm working on a couple of projects in Australia with, with them at the moment. In fact one that we uh, released the report of earlier today which was a project, a project with Music New South Wales um, looking at live music venue accessibility across the city of Sydney. Um, so it was great to be able to draw on that Churchill um, organisational network and of course everything I learned through the fellowship and, and turn it into a, a real life project here in Australia. Um, and my kind of ultimate dream sort of post fellowship is to I'm um, working towards hopefully uh, looking to set up something called uh, an accessibility charter for our live music industry here in Australia. Again, that is something that Attitude is Everything have established in the UK and I'd really love to see, uh, see that happen in Australia and, and working to make that a reality. Um, now, in terms of my top tips, and Adam's given me so many in the first part of um, today's presentation, um, you know, I, I just want to start by saying uh, I didn't get a Churchill Fellowship on my first go. For me, it was my, my second go and, and a couple of years later. And um, for me, I think what what helped me crack it the second time round was having a really clear project idea. And I like to think of it as what is the problem you're trying to solve or what's the gap you're trying to fill and being really clear and specific about that because as Adam said, um, not everyone's gonna know the ins and outs of accessibility in the music industry. So how, how to explain that to you know, any, any old Joe blogs on the street. I found it really valuable to chat to previous fellows and in fact I'm so open to talking to anyone um, wanting to apply for a Churchill Fellowship in the future. Um, I can see people on this call who helped me with my application um, and I, I'm, I had a call earlier today in fact with someone who's going to be applying this year um, so really happy to chat to anyone about my experience and I think that was really valuable for me as an applicant. Um, I found myself an application buddy, so a friend of mine was applying as well, and we kind of sat around the kitchen table together one weekend and, and um, you know, bashed out our applications together, um, you know, wordsmithing and tweaking each other's applications as we went, and I found that really valuable. Um, allowing yourself some time to get a few different people to have a read of your application for, um, for you and give you some feedback, I think, um, in terms of particularly people who don't know your subject um, area to, to say, does, you know, does this make sense? Is this clear? Uh, referees, I think, are, play a really important role because they are quite a detailed referee uh, letter that you need to submit. Um, and for me, I kind of, um, you know, I kind of tried to choose people that had some um, some standing in the in the arts community. I went with um, Tony Grabowski, who was the CEO at the Australia Council at the time, um, and also Richard Evans, who was running the Australian Chamber Orchestra, who uh, I guess Tony was my personal referee. Um, I worked with him closely. And then Richard, as a music organisation in Australia, wanting to, to do better work around disability, um, he was my project referee saying that, yes, this is um, really you know, a, a much needed project. Um, and when you're all, when you're all successful with your, your applications and you get an interview, um, practicing that pitch and practicing the interview, um, I did that with, with many colleagues and friends in the lead up to that interview process, which I think, um, you know, was the reason I was able to, to present well. Um, and yeah, look, you know, common things about once you're putting your itinerary together, try not to overfill your schedule, but I, wouldn't, I didn't take my own advice there at all. Um, scheduling early, I probably started scheduling meetings maybe three or four months out. Um, and I've also, I've written a blog, which you can have a look at on my website, moenacollette.com, uh, um, which talked about um, my Churchill 
fellowship experience and what I wish I had known, I guess, when um, mapping out my, uh, my Churchill journey. So feel free to have a look if, if that's um, useful to you. But I think um, that was everything that I was going to share with you and um, we'll take questions at the end and I'm um, happy to answer any questions that you've got about my experience. So thanks, Adam. Fantastic. Thanks, Moana. That, that was really interesting and I'm sure everyone really enjoyed that. So um, we'll move on and I'll introduce uh, our second Churchill Fellow, uh, Trish Adjay. Uh, Trish is from New South Wales, um, was awarded her Churchill Fellowship also in 2018. And uh, I'm sure they won't mind me sharing this, but I just learnt at the beginning of this session that um, Moana and, and Trish may have been sitting almost next to each other in their workplaces and neither of them knew they were applying. So, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, how many people sitting near you guys uh, thinking of applying might also be thinking of applying. So um, Trish's project was to investigate the protection of Indigenous cultural rights in Panama and the United States. And uh, Trish is the head of First, First Nations Art and Culture at the Australian Council for the Arts um, on Gadigal Country. And um, I'm not going to steal her thunder. I will let Trish introduce herself and um, hand over now. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Adam. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Adam said, I'm Trish Ajay. Um, I'm Torres Strait Islander, so I'm Wafathi from East Cape York and Bobby York Island in Torres Strait, but I was born on the mainland and I am um, currently living on Gadigal and Bidjigal country. So I pay my respects to elders past, present and uh, emerging and also acknowledge any um, First Nations people in the audience as well. Uh, so like Moeno, I was really um, excited and happy to be awarded this fellowship. Um, it has a lot of prestige that comes with it and it was really a great opportunity to uh, research a topic that I'm very passionate um, about. Uh, I have a legal background as well um, and was really sort of curious around these kind of unique laws that I'd heard about uh, in Panama in the US that really aim to protect uh, Indigenous cultural IP rights. So they really uh, are laws that are sort of stopping um, the misuse and misappropriation of Indigenous art and culture in, in these two countries. Um, and as some of you might know, you know, it's a big issue here in Australia. There's been uh, a number of um, federal uh, inquiries around this issue into the Indigenous visual arts and craft market and, and the type of organisations that I've worked with over the years um, have been involved in like the Fake Art Harms Culture campaign. Uh, and so I wanted to see um, you know, travel to these countries and hear about and, and, and talk about these laws that um, uh, aim to protect, uh, you know, elements of sort of communal ownership of Indigenous art and culture. Uh, so I was really sort of bringing in my legal um, practice and also my love and, and passion of the arts as well. Uh, and my cousin actually, um, based in Queensland, Denisha Duff, she did a fellowship um, uh, back in the sort of mid 2000s and she really encouraged me also to apply for a fellowship uh, so that's why I, I sort of got the idea to um, you know apply for the fellowship but um, as I as I said I had the reasons um, sort of really laid out for me I thought about the project um, for a while you know which countries I was going to go to um, what type of uh, issues I wanted to think about who I wanted to meet with uh, and then I sort of narrowed it down specifically to the two countries. I also went to um, Geneva in Switzerland because I have been involved also in a number of United Nations discussions that have been happening around the protection of intellectual property and Indigenous peoples uh, at the World Intellectual Property Organization. So I was also fortunate enough to go and talk to uh, the different um, uh, organizations in Geneva that are also addressing these issues at that sort of international level, like developing new international laws in this area as well. Um, so like Moena, I started contacting these organizations before I left Australia. Um, and I also had contacts um, through my work uh, in Geneva um, to the, the, the um, Kuna people in Panama. So I knew some Kuna uh, lawyers who I'd met in Geneva and they were also able to um, introduce me to different Kuna advocates and lawyers and artists in Panama. 
Um, and yeah, I was really fortunate to uh, spend four weeks overseas, um, first going to Geneva and then the US and then Panama. Um, my schedule was a bit sort of looser than Moena's. So because um, I was away for the month, I um, would do sort of a couple, two to three interviews per day. But I had days where I was kind of resting as well. You know, you, you, you want to sort of have a travel day as well so you don't get exhausted. And then I also had time to um, have those kind of meetings that were unexpected that I didn't sort of plan to, to have. And also um, visit different cultural and arts um, institutions. I, when I was in Panama, I was lucky enough to also travel out to Cunialla, which is the indigenous territory of the Kuna people of Panama, which are sort of beautiful uh, tropical islands um, on, the, on the Caribbean side of Panama, um, you know, turquoise water. Uh, and so it was really sort of nice to be able to, to have that experience to, to go to an indigenous territory and meet um, local Kuna uh, artisans as well um, as part of my um, research and, and talk to people about, you know, how effective these laws work in Panama um, and, and sort of learn more about, you know, how it was um, developed uh, back in 2000. I think also um, in terms of some of the um, issues that I found really surprising, um, I also have a, a sociology degree in my, um, my, I did an arts law degree at UNSW and I have a sociology background. So I started also going down this kind of historical and sociological reasoning behind these laws. Like for example, if you can imagine in America, the Indian Arts and Craft Act was introduced in the 1930s. And at that time, obviously um, indigenous uh, Native American communities were being sort of wiped out and you know culture being um, eroded, and so I sort of I couldn't really understand how this type of law that was trying to protect and promote authentic Native American art was being introduced um, at the same time as these communities being uh, destroyed. So I was talking to the Indian Arts and Craft Board in in Washington D.C. about these issues, but also I spoke to a number of different. Uh, Native American um, directors and artists and, and um, academics who really sort of gave me the background um, into um, when the law was implemented and the reasoning behind it was around sort of economic um, development for Native American communities uh, in America at that time. So I sort of was, I found it surprising that I got so interested in, in going down that sort of path, um, but it was really, really beautiful to have those conversations and, and you know, meet new people and um, have those unexpected conversations that I hadn't really um, thought about having as well. I think the best thing about being um, a Churchill Fellow was having that, that real time and luxury to really explore a topic that you're passionate about and not having, um, and, you know, meeting new people overseas, creating new networks, uh, and having the resources as well to do this really interesting work that you're passionate about uh, and that you want to see something change uh, in Australia. Uh, and so I think it's really important to think about sort of setting, um, as Moena talked about, setting a program that, um, you know, you're, you're wanting to investigate um, <clears throat> or experience something that's happening uh, really well overseas and what lessons you can learn and bring that back to Australia to fill any sort of gaps in policies or programs, um, or in my case, laws that we don't have here in Australia. So that was really the drive um, for my fellowship as well. I think in terms of, um, as everyone's, Adam and Moina have talked about, in terms of preparation, um, you know, it's really, it's really important to have a look at the Churchill Fellowship website, um, sort of what, run through, um, oh, sorry, run through, uh, sorry, have a look at um, different projects that, um, uh, you know, are in the art sector that have been done, you know, in the past kind of decades, and really sort of talk to any um, Churchill Fellows who have um, gone on their trip and, and sort of discuss your topic and your practice. Um, also, um, as Melwena said, find a buddy to practice the interview because um, the interview is quite short, it's about 10 to 12 minutes. So, um, you know, sort of practicing having short, succinct answers in your interview, really know your topic uh, and, you know, what lessons are you going to bring back uh, to Australia? 
but also remember that um, you're you're an expert in your topic as well. So um, you know you can talk about you know why you you want to do this research, what you've seeing overseas and what you might bring back to Australia as well. Um, but I think in terms of uh, being a Churchill Fellow uh, in the arts industry, uh, it's great that um, Moena and I, you know, we still meet regularly with another um, Churchill Fellow, Joe Higgins. Um, we meet sort of a couple times a year and, you know, we collaborate on different projects and we've done a couple of talks as well over the last two years um, about our, our research. Um, but I also found that um, uh, in terms of the recommendations that I put in my report, um, that they're starting to be referenced in a number of different sort of research projects um, that are happening at the federal level. So for example, uh, the government agency IP Australia that looks after and administers all the intellectual property laws in Australia, like trademarks and patents, they've set up an Indigenous reference group um, so they've referenced my um, report in that work. And there's also a, a committee that's also looking at a scoping study around better protection for Indigenous cultural IP in Australia. And again, they've referenced my report uh, in that work. And then finally, uh, last year, the Productivity Commission uh, held an inquiry into the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts sector uh, in a market. And uh, again, they were really interested in the work and the research that, um, that I did and reference um, the laws in, in the US and, and Panama and how we might be able to um, establish a similar law here in Australia. But um, yeah, I'm really sort of grateful that I had this opportunity and always happy, uh, as Moena said, to talk to anyone about um, their application process and um, you know, your topic as well. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks uh, so much, um, Trish. Um, look, uh, Moana, if you want to bring your camera back on, that's fantastic. Uh, we'll work through some questions and I'm sure more will appear as we go through. So the first is, uh, should we obtain a supporting letter from the overseas host organisation before submitting the application? Look, that's not necessary. The only you know, uh, caveat I put there is if you put a pretty amazing um, organisation or individual that we think, wow, they're really going to meet with you. It might not be a bad idea to have something in your pocket to whip out at the interview, but um, ultimately we don't expect you to have that locked in place. Um, Ren has said uh, that his spoken or her spoken language is not available as an op uh, option on the drop down list in the form. Is there somewhere else you can add that? Look, um, we're always adding to that list. So maybe send an email to the trust and let us know and we'll get that added to the list. So I think for the moment, there's probably nowhere else to stick that. Um, and that's really for our, it won't be used as part of the assessment. So our assessors won't see that. That's that's something for us to get a good understanding that we are reaching um, you know, a diverse range of people with applications. Um, do the referees references have to be uploaded to the system before we can submit? Absolutely. So when you, you go into your application form, you'll select, you know, Mawena and Trish as your referees. You put the email in, it'll um, send them an email, the system will automatically, and they'll click on a link, go in, they'll put the referee comments in, hit submit, that's automatically uploaded to your form. When you go to submit, before it lets you submit, you'll have to choose a couple of um, uh, references uh, to, to put in there. So um, make sure you call your referees, don't just send them an email through the system and hope they see it, because it could go to their junk. Uh, they could be on leave and not see your email. So just it sounds like obvious tips, but sometimes people overlook that. And then our um, number one phone calls we get on the closing date are people saying, they're kind of freaking out because their references aren't done. So don't let that be you because there's not, not much we can do to help at that point. Um, someone has asked if uh, travel to multiple countries is preferred over a single country. So no, uh, it's not preferred either way. That really comes down to your project. So a good example is we've got a fellow who's leaving in a few weeks to go to one place in Italy where he's going to be uh, studying uh, a course on Italian patisserie. Sounds awesome. That's, that's kind of what he does. He's going to start off a course here in Australia. Um, and that's no better or worse than the person that's going to, you know, three or four countries to do their project. So it really depends on your project. Um, is there a downloadable, downloadable version of the application so we can prepare the questions? Look, kind of. So the um, application guide, if you go to the Become a Fellow link on our website, which is at the top, it'll open up a page. You'll see an application guide that'll download a PDF 
uh, guide, which is really useful. So have a look at that if you haven't already. And all the parts of the form are in there. So all the questions are there. But honestly, um, you know, uh, my best advice is get in and start your application. Uh, start filling it out, get a bit excited, get moving with it. Um, you can go in and out of that form, you know, as often as you like before you submit. So um, plenty of opportunities there as well. Uh, a question about the previous info sessions, were they recorded? Uh, yes, they've all been recorded. They'll be uploaded, well, I would have said tomorrow, but the person doing that um, for us is, is unwell, um, thanks COVID. So um, we will get them uploaded hopefully in the next few days and they'll be on YouTube and we'll put links up on our website. They will have captions. I have to say I'm a bit embarrassed that um, we tried to get um, our captioning working this week with um, Otter AI. I think we'll try and integrate and this hasn't worked. I'm not sure why, but we haven't got that up and running. So if you're um, relying on that tonight, um, I do apologize. Um, if you do have questions and you want to work through it, call the office over the next few days. Um, we're very small here, but we're all happy to um, talk to you as well. Um, and Howard says hello. Um, and Julie, uh, wondering if um, how requesting a dependence allowance influences the application assessment, doesn't at all. I'm not even sure if assessors can see that, to be honest. Um, it's not part of the assessment. Um, it, it's really something for, for us at the trust. Um, wondering how a fluctuating household income works with regard to the 50% household income loss. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think probably if you, we best maybe taking it from the last time you submitted a tax return, maybe as a stable point from which to draw. Look, if any doubt, um, you know, give us a call and discuss it. Um, you know, you could wait until you, if you're um, awarded, perhaps that's a, a, maybe an easier time to discuss that then. Um, double checking that you don't need to submit a detailed budget rationale. No, that's right. So you just tell us uh, which countries, um, which cities, for how long, we'll work out the airfares. We have a central uh, arrangement for, through FCM for booking all the flights. Uh, we use an exchange rate uh, that we purchase every year um, and we cost out the fellowship based on where you're going so that you have uh, hopefully a generous enough allowance that you can then get paid that in the few weeks before you depart Australia. And then it's up to you to you know, pay for your food and um, living allowances and those sorts of things. Um, how wide should the appeal of your project be to the Australian community? What if it's a relatively niche sector? That's fine. So yeah, it does sound kind of like amazingly um, big, doesn't it? You know, it's got to benefit Australian society, but that could mean a particular uh, community. It could mean a particular um, yeah, niche um, audience. That, that's okay. I think as long as there's some benefit to some aspect of Australian um, society. Uh, we certainly do have some pretty interesting niche um, projects if you have a look at our website. Um, uh, um, Willie says, interested in undertaking an immersive experience in policy labs that have contributed to cultural policy. Uh, we're coming at it from a design perspective to learn tools and methods rather than researching. Sounds pretty interesting to me. Um, so I, look, pretty much anything suitable, as long as you can demonstrate that, you know, you can't do that in Australia, that you, it's an area that you've been, you know, actively engaged in and that there will be a benefit. And you probably need to tell some people, I mean, I come from a bit of a policy background, I, I understand, but some people in the assessing the applications might need a bit of, you know, guide them around what that means, what that looks like, you know, so they can understand. Um, and um, Alana has asked, uh, what are examples of individual creative practitioners, artists, writers, musicians that you have supported? So uh, apart from a winner, um, and, uh, uh, so I'm just trying to think now, um, there are over four and a half thousand fellows, um, a lot of them before my time with the trust. Uh, we we're just talking to someone today, um, oh, sorry, it's late in the day and the names are falling out of my brain, who is uh, an opera singer. Um, she's pretty amazing. Anyway, she is going to be traveling this year on her fellowship. Um, we've had conductors, we've had uh, Baroque music instrument players, we've had uh, music uh, instrument um, creators and makers and repairers. Uh, you know, we've had all sorts of um, artists, you know, whether it's uh, painters, photographers, uh, sculptors, 
um, writers. Not all of them famous and people you've necessarily heard of. Some people have gone on though um, with their fellowships to do some pretty amazing things um, uh, in the creative uh, fields. And, and you know, you find out later that, oh, they're a Churchill Fellow. I did not know that. So um, they're out there. So I suggest go to the website, um, our website. You can search um, in, there's a button called um, Fellows and Projects, and, and then you'll see the ability to search by category. So you could choose arts from there, do a search, and you'll see um, all, all the different people from that category on there. So I hope that's helpful. Sorry, it's, um, I don't have a list in front of me, um, and I've got to try and retain a whole lot of info for this session. So my brain capacity is a bit limited sometimes. Um, can the two referees both be from your work? Look, I think that that's fine if that's um, relevant. With your referees, um, you know, aim for people that, um, I guess aim high if you can, as high to start with as you think is appropriate. Obviously people who, who do know you enough to feel they can be a referee, um, that's important. But if they're both from your work, that's that's fine. Questions still coming in. Sorry, Mawena and Trish, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to answer one as soon as I can. Um, Alexandra is from Victoria. Her project's quite specific to Queensland and related to a professional activity in Queensland. Should you apply in Queensland, Victoria? You have to apply in the state. You'll be assessed in the state where you're living. So um, uh, yeah, that, that's basically the story. If you, if, if you live in Victoria now, you apply with your Victorian address and you'll be assessed in Victoria. Um, can you please say more about writers or their projects? So I guess, what can I say about writers and their projects? Um, we've had some people undertake uh, research uh, for their writing um, and, and travel um, you know, overseas to undertake that research. Or oh, look, Lainey Anderson's a good example. So she is a South Australian, uh, she's a journalist by trade. Uh, she, her, her research uh, for her Churchill Fellowship was all about the Vimmers Vicky, this aircraft that did this amazing around the world race. It's got a really important part in Australia's history, there's actually it's at the the, the plane is actually at the um, Adelaide Airport, and she um, did a whole lot of research, um, um, amazing, uh, and wrote a book. And her book actually turned, as it turns out, it's not all factual. It's a bit of a a, a, a story as well. Um, and then as now it's gone on, there's been a, a great documentary made about it. It's really cool. So that's one example of, of someone that went off and, and researched this book she was writing. So we've got examples like that. Um, you know, we've got, I was just talking to a, a guy yesterday um, from Tasmania and he he's going to Banff um, and he can't go this year. Actually, he has to wait. It's a bit sad, you know, frustrating because I'd like him to go and do his fellowship and with COVID it's been delayed, but it's only held in April, this Writers Festival. It's only held in April every year and he's not going to be able to get away. It's too late now to go. So he won't be going now until 2023. Um, Anyway, so part of his, his fellowship is going to this Banff Writers Festival. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of some of the writers and, and their projects. Um, you know, I guess it's, it's important to note, it's not a grant to help you go and, you know, um, write your book. And unless, you know, you can demonstrate that benefit, you know, to the Australian community. So in the case of um, Laney's project, you know, that, that film is Vicky is a, a really important story historically to Australia and in particular to Adelaide and South Australia. So she, she made a strong link there into um, the relevance. Um, and in that case, also she led a campaign to get that plane taken from the sort of boondocks out in the back of the airport and they committed, the government's committed to, and the airport have committed to display it. Um, so it can be seen by the community and that bit of history can be retained. So think about that that link, you know, if it's just, I wanna go and write a story and, um, there's no real link to benefiting anyone apart from those that might get to read my awesome book. Um, maybe you need to make a stronger connection that way. Um, Moena mentioned her project referee being someone who worked in an Australian organisation. Is it expected the referees are Australian based or could they be from overseas? I was going to say that one for Moena to answer, but it might be more one for me. Um, so look, it's, um, yeah, look, typically we want Australian, but if it's a technical person and you're saying, look, the only person that really has that credibility, it's someone from overseas and that's fine. That's the case. Put forward the, the best referee who can support your case. Um, uh, I've got someone here who's an accountant um, who's interested in helping artists. Well, that sounds pretty cool. Um, can the fellowship help you? Um, your project will be about how you can best do that. You're not an artist. Yourself. Absolutely. 
That's perfectly fine. And in fact, that question of, you know, can the fellowship help you? Look, there's nothing to be afraid of in terms of will you benefit personally from the church or fellowship? Will it grow your business, your reputation? Will it grow you personally? Uh, absolutely, that's fine. As long as, you know, it's not just about you, that there is a way that you're helping the Australian community. So in this case, helping Australian artists sounds fantastic and that sounds perfectly relevant. Um, so the next question is someone who's um, really uh, tearing themselves in two over the personal practice concept, the relationship between literature and storytelling and an empathetic democratic society. So their professional work, um, effective defining and reporting on artistic practice to government funders and philanthropists. Okay, that sounds like a bit to digest. Um, is it possible to apply under two different projects in the one round? I would caution against that. Now, the reason is this is super competitive and you can have people like Trish and Moana who are like laser focused, really clear on what their application's about. They're like, you know, you get one shot at this, right? So people are gonna read your application and go, aha, you know, um, uh, CJ wants to apply on this and this is what they're trying to do. If you kind of sit on the fence a bit and, and you know, what's that, you know, to grossly use sayings like, put your eggs in more than one basket, you're gonna dilute your application. And I think it's probably best to be really pick one and be really committed to it if you wanna be successful. I think I've not seen anyone yet be successful when they've kind of had two projects and they haven't really decided. So it's gonna be hard. I can see that, but I think best to, to pick one. Um, oh, good one here, yeah, Moena and Trish, get ready. So how to talk about how you went about setting up your interviews with people you wanted to meet with. So um, perhaps who wants to go first? Moena. Um, yeah, great question. I, because uh, I was going to two main territories, the UK and the US, um, I kind of started by reaching out to people in my topic area that I knew there um, and asked for their advice around who else would be good to, to meet with and who else is doing good work in this space. So also just a hell of a lot of Googling. Um, but I found that sort of once you booked in one person, they'd tell you about two other people and it kind of really grew from there. So I found having, you know, one or two key people people that could guide me in each territory I was visiting was really helpful. Yeah, similar. I mean, I had um, sort of already uh, one person I knew in Panama and he was really sort of crucial in introducing me to a lot of different people. And I had sort of um, once, you know, I'd met one person, they'd be like, oh, you should talk to this person. And then you'd sort of have these follow-up interviews with different government. I mean, I was talking to different government officials and different artists. I ended up in the Panamanian um, uh, National Parliament uh, one day when the, there was a group of artists lobbying for um, cultural a cultural authority in Panama. So that was an interesting kind of last minute <laughs> um, uh, activity that I did. Uh, and then in the US, I also had networks here in Australia that you know, would um, sort of recommend one person. And then, yeah, once I was in America, um, they would be like, I'll talk to this person, meet this person, go and see this person as well. Um, so, yeah, you sort of start off with one or two um, ideas, either Googling or through your networks, and then it kind of grows from there. Great, great answers. And, and uh, more for you, for both of you. Um, can you talk a bit about how you were able to the information you were seeking wasn't available in Australia and I guess that's you know in your application and perhaps an interview. Yeah I mean I don't know that I specifically address that other than saying that it, it wasn't because um, it is such a, a niche very new field music and, and disability like in in what I was looking at in Australia so yeah, I think I just kind of said that this was the case and that the knowledge was in the UK and the US and that's where I had to go to, to get it. Um, but I also, I remember in my application also talking about the fact that I had been talking about this issue with Australian music organisations and I knew that there was a demand and they were hungry for this knowledge to, to be available here. Yeah, I think just really from my experience and because it, again, um, protection of Indigenous cultural IPs also quite niche. Um, so I had that experience and knew that there wasn't a law here in Australia. And I had heard about these laws in Panama and the US. So I wanted to explore um, the law, the, the effectiveness of those laws in the US and Panama um, and uh, see how effective they were, what lessons we could bring back to Australia, what type of challenges they had in implementing those laws uh, in those countries. 
Great. And, and I think, look, one thing I would add uh, for, for anyone thinking of applying, your uh, project referee, they're going to be quite critical. So, you know, I'm a project referee. Um, and I'm going to say, look, this, this is an issue that is of importance to Australia. And I might say, look, I'm aware there's only a few people who are working in this space and there really is a sort of dearth of information. And I know there's some great things happening in Germany and wherever. So your project referee could be quite important in that regard. I know that we always look at that when we're assessing. And our assessors are pretty smart cookies. They do get online, they Google, they search and they try and work out you know, what's going on and suddenly try and become experts in, in a short amount of time. Um, if you do get an interview, you might get asked, you know, they might say, oh, I did a Google search and I noticed and then you'd be prepared to say, well, yeah, that's true. But look, they're not, it's not the same or, you know, just be aware of what's going on so you can quickly um, defend. And you won't get asked, you know, trap questions at interview. You make it to an interview. We're not trying to trick you out of it. We think you're really awesome and we want you to go. So just come in prepared with the knowledge that you probably already have. So on that note, it is 6.12. Um, appreciate um, some people have already had to go. Um, still a lot of people online, so thanks so much for hanging around. And once again, thank you, Trish and Rowena. Really, really appreciate um, you giving up your time and sharing your insights. Um, if you're going to apply, um, please get on, start your application. Uh, good luck with it. Um, and if you have any other questions, you know where to find us. Thank you. Thank you.